Welcome back to part two of my conversation on the crossover with Joe R. Lucas with three of the GMs from Europe, Maurizio Gerardini, Christos Stavropoulos, and of course, Paulias Motejunas from Zalgiris. Let's listen in and see what they have to say as we continue to hear their interesting stories. Changes are, are ever present in your job. Obviously, everything changes on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. And Maurizio, in your case, Selko left the team. He decided to take another year of sabbatical. I'm sure that your friendship with him, you talked about it. You discussed it with him. You knew it was going to happen. And, 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 and it just happened. But you go and sign a guy who is known in Europe, but known more in the basketball world is, as being a, a, an incredible coach, but not so much here in Europe. And the team doesn't do so well in the beginning. As a matter of fact, it was probably the worst month or two that you guys have had in the last five years. What What's going through your mind when... when... You're a nice guy. You underline <laughs> my birthday. You underline our shitty times. You know, you're hey, a good guy. I, I'll talk about if your good I times. Did, I wouldn't come on this podcast, you know, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, we got to make it somewhat difficult sometimes. Yeah, everything can't be peaches and keen here. Well, um... You know, Zerko is Zerko, and you know probably better than than the three of us. And um, he's a he's a friend, probably best friend or one of my best friends, one of my closest persons. So we went through this whole process together, and uh, and uh, and then again at the very very end. Uh, uh, he decided to, you know, to take a year sabbatical to, you know, uh, because sometimes you need it because people don't fully realize how much uh, stressing mm -hmm. our job is and coach's job is even more. And, um, and again, I didn't know myself either, uh, you know, if to continue or not. That was like a consequence of, Zeko decision and I did all the sharing with him all the time and then at the end uh, somehow I you know I felt the responsibility of my situation and uh, and I you know uh, and let's say things kept moving forward I had the club support and uh, and, and we you know we tried to design the new the new picture but like you said um, there was no way that I could find that someone like Jerko on the market. It was impossible. And um, I like your question because talking about relationship and friendship, uh, one of the two gentlemen, uh, Paulius in this case, is uh, such a good friend that we did a lot of sharing on this subject. So he knows exactly what I went through and I know exactly what he went through because he asked me afterwards, you know? Uh, that's my oh. next question. That's my next question. You oh, guys are you guys I, are good at this, man. You guys, thank God you're GMs. You're not going to take my job. Yeah. <laughs> so I I said, hey, we I need to look for someone that is uh, uh, again that is not uh, uh, let's say it cannot be Zerko. Has to be something different. Ideally, I said it, it would be great if he can be someone who is who has knowledge of both worlds. And the name of, you know, Igor's name was like the ideal name, but I, I did not have a, an idea if he was going to be available or not. Mm -hmm. And somehow I was surprised on the first call to, you know, understand how enthusiastic he was about such an opportunity. And, uh, and again, that helped me a lot going through the change, uh, going through, uh, let's say, getting on board, even if he had to work from the bubble in Orlando because he had to work for Sacramento. In a way, it was even mm -hmm. tougher to explain to Vlade Divas why I wanted, you know, uh, Igor out of his uh, job commitment to join, uh, to join Fenerbahce because right. Igor was, was fully enthusiastically on board and excited to come to Istanbul. But again, this was the this was July, 
And then we tried to build the team uh, with Zoom calls and phone calls. It was not simple to get ready for the August start. And then we start the season. And like you delicately pointed out, things were not clicking. And, uh, and again, a lot of you know, thoughts come to your mind. And, uh, and I remember uh, sharing with Paulius the, the feelings, the pros and contras. And, and, and again, I like before when you were asking Christos uh, about how you relate to a coach and especially a coach that you know that you sell the job to and you want to support you want him as a friend I think it's very important how you build this relationship how you you look into the guy's eyes in a very realistic way because that's the the best way to discuss an issue a problem a, a potential solution and uh, and we spend time to you know, to analyze what was, what was going wrong, what we could have done better. What we, and that, you know, and then we try to share the same process with the, with, the, with the board members. That's where we got full support from the club to try to add one or two pieces to balance up a chemistry that, that was not working. I mean, it was not, uh, we, we were missing something. We were also injury prone in that period but uh, you know injuries is part of our business and when when they judge your season they don't think about the injury exactly. and uh, after the first three months of competition everybody was talking about covid and how clever we were not to have any covid cases but if you look at the numbers of missed, missed games and practices we were by far the worst team because we were always at injuries and that affected also our yeah. chemistry result but again, it all starts from uh, being realistically on the picture, sharing as much. Communication is the key. Communication is the key in your relationship with the, co with the coach. Communication is the key in your relationship with the people who are supposed to support you, with your president, with your board, you know, with your board people. Because you want to try to, you, you know, we're all on the same boat. We all really want to try to... to to make the most out of the situation. But we also need to understand that sometimes, you know, the equation doesn't work. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we need to make radical changes. Sometimes we cannot do certain things, you know. And uh, again, now, you know, in April, everything looks like, hey, it was a great season. You made the playoffs. But as you said, there were some very, very criti critical yeah. times. And... Uh, and having the possibility of sharing with your own club and your own people and your own coach helps you a lot. Just like I have to say, sharing with Paulius helped me to get, uh, let's say, a vision from the outside. And, mm. and again, and I would do the same for him if he asked me to, because we are all colleagues of the same, uh, the same product, of the same business, you know. You know, the, the, two, the two common denominators, the, the, the two similarities that I've seen between the three of you so far, number one was neither one of you could play basketball well enough, so you decided to do this as a job. That was the first one. So that's not a good one. But the second one is that, that I think is the most important thing is that each one of you, no matter where you go, you develop a culture. Uh, Christos, you mentioned that earlier. You develop a culture of, of winning, uh, 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 not just a winning attitude, but, but a... A, like a tradition within the club. And I think that's really important. And so those are the two things I've noticed. I, and I'm assuming the conversation that Maritza just gave us with Paulius has to do with you losing Zardas, Yasakevich's this year also to your fan base. Is, 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 is the assumption right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, when you... So Jelko is Jelko, you know, if Sharas leaves for me, if I could take Jelko, I would be happy, but uh, he took a year off, so it's, it's, a, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, to, to get to the serious part, it's, you know, to, so Sharas started, you know, first, he's, he was one of the best players in Europe, you know, forever in Euroleague, mm -hmm. and, and then he, he became a great coach like, like, like this, like, you know, in, in one year, yeah. everybody knew that he's a great coach and then the hunt started. So 
each year and each summer i knew that it's you know it, can it was be, a fight <laughs> yeah, yeah each each year it, you know it can be his last and and you kind of try to learn as much as you can but still pa Pauli, is it, Pauli, is it's like you had a supermodel girlfriend <laughs> and and all the guys wanted her <laughs> i pretty pretty much the same thing yes yes and <laughs> And yeah, and you and you learn from him, and you try to get as much as possible, and not only in on the court, but also outside the court. And but still, you have that in your head that you know it's not going to stay forever. And uh, to replace a guy like Sharas, it's it's impossible. Like he, we want to have that Lithuanian mentality, and I started with the Lithuanian coaches. Of course, not a lot were available, but but then I spoke to Mauricio as well. I'm like, you know, what can I do because to replace a guy like that, someone to fill his shoes, it's impossible. And I still remember to this day, he's like, think outside the box. And mm -hmm. it's such a simple thing, like, you know, helped to, to have the, again, say it in a bad way, but have the balls to take a risk and, you know, go talk to the coaches that, you know, are not well known in Europe. Because again, EuroLeague, we, we try to, to have the players that, more or less we know who've been in Europe because again of the transition that you spoke about and and to take someone from who's never been there it's it's a quite big risk but but again if you have a back of, of Maurizio again a back I'm saying you like he said someone you can talk to and someone who dares to to take a risk in a club like Fenerbahce I'm like, okay, I, he's my mentor, he's my teacher, then, you know, if he wants to do it, I need to take a risk as well. So it's a huge step you take and, a, and, and, and sometimes it's good because, like I said, we always, as a small club, have to come up with, uh, with new and mostly it's not safe decisions and take a bigger risk. And that's the only way we can survive. Christos, you brought a legend back, as we talked about, in Ethereum Messina, back to EuroLeague from, from the Spurs, from the NBA. And, and obviously that creates expectations for the club, for your boss, for the fans especially, which I think the fans are always the ones that, are, that have the most expectations of everybody. But it didn't, didn't go as well for you the first year. I mean, the, the team was last year 12 and 16 before it was disrupted by, by COVID. Um, do you see the progress? I, I mean, obviously, you guys made the playoffs this year. Is, was this your expectation? Did you expect more your first season from the team and, and to have this slow growth that you're having right now? Or did you, were you expecting more from them like a, a normal fan would last year? Uh, f first of all, uh, I have to say that uh, this year we built our team. Uh, last mm -hmm. year we came and uh, we, we find half of the team already done. So this, this year uh, we, we had the opportunity to work all together and to build our team like we want the team. Uh, and uh, as far as now, our ex expectations, they are, they are perfect. Uh, we won uh, the, the two Italian titles, the Super Cup and the Italian Cup. We are in the playoffs. That were, was um, the main goal for us to join this, uh, this playoffs. And then we have the, the, the Italian championship. Mm. Uh, we, we are very happy for that. Uh, and uh, we are working. Uh, to do to do more, uh, Ettore is uh, is an experienced coach. Uh, is very demanding coach. He he uh, he wants everything in perfection. All he cares about also the small details, but uh, he has the experience to to guide this this uh, this club to to the top. And um, I, I'm I'm really sure that uh, we can we can reach these goals. My, the, I have one one question for all three of you, and and if you want to answer, it, it's fine. If not, it's fine also. But it, it's a, a maybe a tough question, maybe a difficult question. But we've seen over the years, and and it happens in basketball. It's a, it's evolution. It's going to happen every year, every couple of years. We see cases of players, um, throw some examples out, Juan Carlos Navarro in Barcelona, 
and maybe we're watching now Spanulis coming to the end of his, his, his incredible career. In Madrid, you see players like Felipe, Rudy, JC. I mean, Father Time, as we all know, Father Time is undefeated. You know, that, that's something that we always say. As a general manager, and of course, as an ex-player, I respect clubs that hold on to these players and they keep them around and they want them to keep playing for their clubs and because it's important for the fans. But is there a moment where a GM has to make a, a difficult decision to think about the future of the club? Any one of you. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have this issue with the Ancunas right now. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, as a GM, how can you make, you look at the history of, of the guy who's been there and like, I, I understand that, you know, it's not the same contribution. It's, it's not the same body. It's not the same speed and everything. But for me, like, I have no idea how I could go and say to Paulus, like, hey, listen, we're not going to give you a contract anymore, even though you want to play. So, mm -hmm. like, with that decision, you kind of kill everything that he's done for the club. Right. So that's why, you know, it's, I'm the guy to be honest and say, listen, you know, Father Time is going to catch up to you. If you want to continue, okay, but, you know, this and this is going to happen. And I will not say you cannot do it. I will not give you a contract or something like that. But, you know, you have to find the time when it's, when it's time to leave. Like, I think there are exceptional uh, only moments that can happen like this. But again, in my side, I cannot see that I would come and say, listen, thank you for everything you did. But, you know, now you go on your own. Like, mm -hmm. you have, we have to stick with it because he stuck with us when it was, you know, when we needed him. Now he needs us maybe a little bit more than as a player, we could find somebody else. But we have to stick through it till the end. Christos, Mauricio. No, I have, I have um, similar feelings. I mean, we have uh, Bobby Dixon right now getting to an age that, uh, let's say, for a basketball player is a respectable age, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, uh, there has to be, like I said before, uh, good communication, respect of the persons and evaluating things together but uh, like Paul is saying it's not easy to you know to come one day and say bye-bye like that uh, it's always good and, and you're lucky if, if uh, you know players understand uh, you know when the when the time comes but right. uh, I'm a big fan of motorcycles and Valentino Rossi doesn't understand that time either, you know. So <laughs> what are we talking about, you know? It, it's, uh, it doesn't matter the sport. It, it doesn't I mean, matter father, the sport. It's the same, the same thing. Uh, uh, that's probably, why I, I always wish that I was able to sing because I'd still be doing concerts at 70 years old, you know? <laughs> but the, I mean, I think once that you are a big time player, athlete and successful, doesn't matter which sports you're in, you, you know, you don't want to recognize the fact that the time is going by and things are changing, you know. Right. So. Christos, anything to add in or no? I think the most important thing is, uh, you know, to, to respect the player. Uh, the, this is the most important thing. Uh, it's very helpful to have a solid relationship with him and, uh, uh, if uh, if the separation is coming to be to come natural, uh, I think I think that right now, for cases like that, is difficult because we know that we, we play without fans, with empty stands, and for the player uh, to yeah. start right now without uh, you know a cheering from the from the fans is is. So tough for the player. You 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 were a player, uh, yeah. and you and I think that you understand that. Because not... I I never I it never even when I developed that question, preparing this interview, that part never entered my head. Uh, I mean, I couldn't imagine being a player that steps away this season yeah. after yeah. not having those fans there for you. Wow. Yeah. This is this is this is tough. This is tough. No. Yeah. 
Well, let's get into that then. Let's get into the COVID part. I think it's 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 obvious that that it's something that we have to to touch on. Everything that we spoke about here, and you guys have so been so great. You've been so open, and we're going to finish off with this. You've been so open and honest about everything, sharing. You know, yeah, I know you guys are colleagues, but you're also working against each other sometimes, also. But the COVID thing is something I think that no matter what, had to bring everybody together in in one aspect or another. Because I think everybody had to learn from each other. I mean, it was just a crazy thing. You've done all this preparing. You've done all the signing. You've done all the summer work. You're doing all the work during the year, and boom. On March, what was it, 13th or 14th last year, the season shuts down. First the NBA shut down, then EuroLeague the next day. How do you – I mean, obviously you can't prepare for for a pandemic. Nobody has prepared for a pandemic. It's been over 100 years. But how do you – how did you guys do things? What, what, what was the first, let's, let's start out with the first moment you heard the league was shutting down. What, what, what was the reaction? Christos needs to talk first. He's the politician, you know. So. <laughs> now, honestly, honestly for, for me, it was, it was, a, uh, it was a tough period because uh, I was, I was in Italy alone without my family. Thanks God. Mm -hmm. My family is with me, so I stayed uh, here in Milan uh, for almost three months, close at home. But believe me, they helped me a lot to to communicate with my staff, with my coach, with my assistants, with my staff, and uh, to work almost every day to prepare to prepare the next season. And uh, this this helped me helped me a lot. Uh, I think that right now we are more prepared. Uh, in the beginning, it was a shock for everybody, especially here in Italy. We remember what happens in Lombardia, in Bergamo. It was, was, was very tough. It was very tough. But uh, now I think, uh, I think that we are all prepared. Uh, my, uh, uh, I think that the, the most important thing is the communication. Uh, we lost a little bit of communication and uh, personally I'm trying uh, every day uh, to have a communication not only by phone or by text messages but to make video call because I think that we lost one each other so I'm trying also with the agents with our uh, people that I collaborate every day to have more video calls so we can see each other, we can interact with each other because we, we lost communication. This is, this is the main problem uh, right now, I think. Maulias or Mauricio? No, I mean, uh, Christos is right. I mean, uh, the, uh, I think my main concern when, when the pandemic issue broke up was internally as, as club to stay connected. So uh, technology in this case really helped because we found a way to stay connected. So the sharing had to be a daily sharing with all the components of the club. I mean, uh, if it was not every day, it was every other day, but we needed to feel like life was going on no matter how bad the emergency was. And then, of course, and then you, you, you start to digest the, the emergency and you, you start to think, hey, how can new plans be made? How can I minimize the potential losses? How can I make any sort of rebuilding plan? But as, as Christo said, the, 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 main, the first main concern was how do we keep communicating with the rest of the world? And... Uh, uh, I remember when I saw, you know, face-to-face -face Christos and Paulius for the first time after the pandemic issue was like, hey, uh, you know, uh, it's like guys that you, you were used to, to see on a monthly basis that you don't see for, you know, for such a long time. Right. And you know, the funniest thing that happened to me, I have to say, that that, thinking about this, one day I, I, I went to see Barcelona, you know, went to see, we had to play Barcelona. So I, I took a moment to go and pay my visit to Euroleague and, and Jordi was there. And I say, you know, hey Jordi, hi, how are you? And Jordi looked at me and said, hey, but 
Is, is that all you say? See, I was so used to seeing him on, on Zoom calls and everything that right. I didn't realize that I hadn't seen him face to face for almost a year. <laughs> That's that's how you get used to uh, you know to 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 a new picture you know. Yeah, it's it, it, it's just all been crazy for everybody. Paulus, what about like like players, for example? Like, but I mean, because I think Christos, the first thing you mentioned was he was without family, and there's players here that come to Europe and don't have their families with them either, whether it's their wife and their kids or their mom and their dad or whoever. How how difficult was it to deal with players who obviously wanted to pick up and go home? because people were dying and they want to be with their families, but the league wasn't, the, the league wasn't sure yet. It, it, it was just a crazy time. Well, we, we made a decision saying that if you want to go, then go. Uh, mm. And uh, I think one of, only one of the players left, uh, Jock Landale went to Australia like one day or a couple hours even before it was closed down and you could not leave. Right. And all, all the others stayed, but, but yeah, we, you know, we n nobody expected that it's going to be this long. Everybody yeah. was expecting it to go for like one or two months max. Like we had concerts for March, then we moved them to May. Then from May, right. we moved them to September. And now everything's moved to whenever. So nobody expected it to be this much. And I think it was, if you look at it back then, it's, you know, we, there was so much uncertainty, but there was so much hope that it's going gonna, it's gonna to end soon. And now there's still the same uncertainty, but there's not that much hope that it's going to end soon and we have to deal with it. So, I mean, it was tough, but, but we still try to stay in the same, like in the same ribbon because I told to, to, the, to the players, if you want to come and practice, you know, there's nobody there. There's no people working. There's only one security guy, but you still have the entrance. And if you want to do, you know, everything is there for your grabs. And a lot of players did, because what do you do? And they say, don't right. work. And, you know, if you don't go to work, you don't, as a player, you lose your form and you lose exactly. your, your contract for the future. So you're not, you're, not an off, you're not an office guy who could take two weeks off and, and be okay. And, and practice on Zoom and, and yeah. do your work on Zoom and, and stuff like that. So, but still, in a way, it, it's tough for, for, you know, for the community of basketball. But I, I also want to say that we are privileged. Because the games are still on, like the right. fans cannot come. Many people loved, uh, lost the people that they love, you know, or, or lost their jobs. And, and the pandemic hit us so hard, but the basketball players and the basketball world, we are touched a lot by not having fans, but the game itself is going on. And this is, you know, something that we should really cherish and be proud of that we found a way how to play the games and, and how to, how to, played in a more or less safe environment as well. And I think, again, we're just privileged to have basketball going on. If I go back to October when EuroLeague made a, a quick decision to change some of the, the, the bylaws that they put out to, for the COVID season and, and be able to replay these games, are, are you guys surprised right now collectively that, that in what, I think five or six days, the regular season will be finished and everybody will play their games. Is that, is that a surprise to you? Well, not, a, not a, I wouldn't say a surprise. Um, I think uh, uh, we need to be collectively um, proud of what we achieved. I think we did achieve it also because clubs worked together to help each other to make things easier for everybody, traveling, connecting, playing games. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, our focus was on COVID because we were coming from the, let's say, initial COVID uh, issue as a, an issue that we could not manage. But at the end of the day, the biggest issue could have eventually developed from, you know, traveling limitations. So. Right. Uh, it was more, let's say, a logistical issue than a, than a medical issue. But at the end, I think uh, uh, Euroleague and, and you know clubs made the right adjustments. And I think uh, I think as a, as a, as a league, I think we we must be proud that we this week we're going to play game number thirty four and we we complete the regular season again. Uh, when we started, uh, we were all hoping 
to get to this point. But exactly. nobody, nobody had any certainties that we could have got to this point. And at the end of the day, like, like Paulius and Christos have mentioned, uh, uh, pandemic, uh, the, the pandemic issue uh, brought a lot of uh, missing pieces to our life, whether our, uh, you know, uh, friends or people or fans. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we kept our business, our basketball product live and we kept it live for, you know, also for people to enjoy from home, which was not, which was not that easy to predict when we, yeah. when we made those adjustments and we start the league in October. So uh, I think we've, we've done, uh, I mean, knock on wood, but let's so far, yeah, exactly. been, you know, so far, so far has been, uh, has been a great job by every, everybody. And, uh, uh, and again, we can't wait for things to go back to normal. We can't wait to have fans back. But in reality, we're we're still managing a very unpredictable time. And uh, one of one of my one of my thoughts was for unfortunately, Paulo is not for you in this case, but in for Christos and for for Maurizio. Will there be like for the playoffs? Will there be like a bubble situation where you guys try to like? keep the team together to make sure that the five game playoff that you guys will be playing will be, you'll be secure to not lose a player for some stupid play, some stupid like night out or whatever. Is, is that a concern of you guys? I mean, it had to be a concern throughout the whole season. Ma, it's not a concern because everything is closed. So it's not a concern about the night <laughs> life of the players. No. But uh, is, I think that is, uh, is important and uh, we are lucky in our team that uh, we have uh, professional uh, guys that they know what to do. They know how to protect themselves. And uh, this is the important thing. And this, for, for this reason, we, we are, we are uh, now. Uh, I, I agree with, with Maurizio and I will add also that uh, this this situation brought us more closer the clubs together to work together and uh, to sometimes also to to over our limits uh, all the clubs they work very very hard uh, we ma we made and they made all the clubs uh, exceptions to to play all the games to visit difficult situation in uh, in uh, various uh, countries and uh, the, the big success is uh, in a few days we finish the regular season. This is a big success. This is a big success. And this is a success of everybody. And this is, uh, if we have, a, we, we, we try to get a positive point, this is a positive point that we work all together and we prove that we, we, we can make great things together. This is, this is great. You know, for me personally, there was a point in mid-October, late October, where I was I was more concerned that we wouldn't finish this season than I was last year when the pandemic originally hit because it just didn't seem like we would get to this point. I think what Mauricio says is knock on wood that this year we're going to be able to actually crown a champion and, and, and do it the right way. So um, for both of you guys, I wish you guys luck in the playoffs. And, and my last question is going to be, something that I get in trouble for all the time. And, and like every time if I say something publicly or in an interview, like I always get these tweets and the, the, the media, the media, it's just crazy. But I, I think in my mind that, and correct me if I'm wrong, the NBA is the NBA and, and your league is your league. And, and I don't know, I, I don't think that'll ever change for some of the things that you said, Christos, before the, the, the power that they have and the economy that they have. But on a night to night basis, I, I always said that the Euro League is a better league. It's a better product, let's say. Not a better league, a better product. And it's because on a night-to-night -night basis, you have to bring your best. In the NBA, we've seen teams, obviously, you can go on a three, four-game losing streak. It's no big deal. Here you go on a three, four-game losing streak. You could be out of the playoffs or it could be, you know, you, you could lose your position. Do you guys agree with me that the, the, the Euro League is a better product on a night-to-night -night basis or – better than the NBA to watch on a night-to-night -night basis for the fans, for the spectators, for everybody around the game? I will use uh, a Greek word. A Greek word that is... Not, not, not Malaga. 
למה להקיע? The Greek word is pathos, is passion. I think that we have to passion to, to, to have all the fans with us all over the year, to, to, to live this, this passion, this devotion to the game. And this is, this is very important for, for our game. And for, for this reason, we have this, this success for our competition, I think. Christos, Christos used the word pathos. I, you know, I lived the NBA for a few years mm. and, and I would use the word adrenaline. It's a different adrenaline flow that uh, you may like it or you may not like it. But uh, uh, I think words like pathos, like passion, like adrenaline, I think better describe the emotion that we live on a daily basis. Not that the NBA product does not live this because uh, I still have goosebumps when uh, as Raptors, we reach our first game uh, in the playoffs. Uh, you know, first time we got in the playoffs in, you know, and won the first division championship it was like very special night, but we live this adrenaline, this pathos every night we play. And this is, I think, the beauty of the EuroLeague product. Oh, yes. Yeah, I would agree uh, with uh, with both. You, you got to give me a Lithuanian word, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I would challenge you that they have uh, you know they definitely have a, a a better system how they run the league and and better economy how everything's put in and I think that's where our focus should be as as the clubs and the league, especially in this in this post pandemic uh, situation we have we have to get our budgets together we have to find some rules how. We all survive together and, and not the, the biggest budget or, or the biggest uh, owner, you know, creates a lot of advantage. So I think it's, it's something that we have to look at as, as the clubs and the league, because yes, we have a better product. I, I mean, I don't like watching NBA, NBA. It's two minutes of the clips and everything. You see what, you know, what they wanted to give you. And in, in our games, mostly it's point to point, and it's you know like 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 Maurizio said, every every day is is the passion, adrenaline. I don't know, I, I, devotion, everything. It's just, devotion as Euroleague's word. I know, I know. I'm, I'm not trying to be the political like Christos. No, I mean, I think again, I'll get back to the fans. It's just the fans. Yeah. In the NBA, you watch the show. And here, when they come to watch the game, they're ready to die for your team. They're ready to give everything they can to shout the lungs out, to cuss the referees out, especially in Kaunas. But, but, this is, <laughs> but this is how much they cheer for the team. I think they're much more engaged than the NBA guys. Okay, the later stages, we see that the, the, in the playoffs, in the finals, the NBA changes a lot. But I'm just happy that we can experience every time we hear the EuroLeague anthem uh, and for every EuroLeague game we have that. I, I always compare it. The, the, my two words, if we're going to use words, is, is NBA is corporate and EuroLeague is fans. And, and I think that's what separates the two, the product. It doesn't make one better than the other. It just makes, it makes this one a little bit more, a lot more adrenaline, a lot more passion, and a lot of devotion. And, and that's the, the, one of the things that, that I, I, I most like about it. So just to finish things up, I, I watch you guys through these three hours, three hours, these two hours, and I see you writing things down, looking at your computer, doing things. So you guys are still working. I, I know the day to day, you're even working while, while I'm interviewing you, but I just want to tell you guys how much I appreciate uh, the time that you were able to take out of your busy day to, to sit down with me here at the crossover. I know that, that, that it's, it, it's a, a large commitment for you guys to do this. So I really appreciate it. And, and I just want to know, like, I, I'm assuming that, uh, let's see, Christos, you'll be, when this is all done and over with, you'll be living on some Greek island. Maurizio, you'll be down at the Malfi coast. I'm, I'm assuming, Pauli, is you're going to be out in some field hunting and fishing with, with some bonus. And, and, and that's what you guys want to do. But, but when is it over for you guys? Because this is a job that you can do forever. 
Well, let's, let's say, let's give the younger, youngest guy the floor. Maurizio, go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah. That's why you got my birthday wrong, you know. I did. No, no, I'm just joking. Uh, okay. I, I, I might have got the day wrong. I didn't get the year wrong. I can tell you that. <laughs> no, I think, uh, you know, we just talked about Valentino Rossi and company. Uh, uh, or Yankunas as an example, or Bobby. And uh, I want to, I want to, I'm not going to talk after this anymore, but I want to give you a final thought. Okay. One, one good friend of mine, short story, yeah, short story. One good friend of mine is Steve Nash. Mm -hmm. And Steve Nash, uh, we work together for Canada basketball and, uh, and we're still, in touch, you know, and he's, he came to Istanbul also for a week. So we had a interesting sharing, a, you know, few, two, three years ago. Steve Nash, when he was enshrined in the Hall of Fame, uh, he said something that kind of, I will never forget. And that is, uh, you know, basketball. You, you, you fall in love with, with basketball, with playing, or being a GM in our case. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you live this passion fully to a point that you don't even have balance in your life. You acquire the balance as you go through the years mm -hmm. be because you live on the passion, on the, on the, on, on the moment, and on, on, uh, on how you live this profession. And I think, and, and he also said, the thing that you're going to miss more when you stop playing in his case is the fact that every day you go out and give 110% of what you have every day. And this is how much you are passionate about what you're doing. And I think in our, in my case, I don't want to say in our case, but the answer is, is very, very simple. When, uh, you know, when, you don't have that feeling anymore when you don't have the feeling that you're giving 110% to your, your passion, then I think is, is the time to go fishing salmons or laying down on a Greek beach, uh, you know, or, uh, or enjoying the Amalfi coast. And then, then, it, then it's, then it's the time. But, uh, I think that, uh, the, what you feel inside is going to be determining or how, how, much longer you can still go or how much longer you feel like you're still energetic enough to do what, what we're doing because it, it's it, it's a tough job at the end of the day no matter how smiling the three of us are it's a tough job with much yeah. more pressure and responsibility than than people realize even if we are the first one to realize that we're very very privileged so Enough. I'm not going to talk. So you're, you're not allowed to talk anymore. And, and I just want to make a comment on that. I have a lot of passion to go lay down on a Greek beach right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm very passionate about it. Christos, when, when are you going to know? As I say, I, I'm assuming it's probably the same answer for the, all three of you, but I just want to hear it from you. L listen, uh, I would like to say, first of all, to, to, to thank you for, for the great opportunity that uh, you gave me to be with you and uh, with Maurice and Paulus with a great honor and I enjoy this, uh, this, this, uh, this podcast. Uh, I would like to close with, uh, with the words. I, I, I will read uh, the words of a great poetess, Maggie Angelou. Maggie Angelou said, I have learned that people will forget what you say. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. This we try to leave a legacy and to create these moments to feel. Love it, love it. Go ahead, Bal Balius, since you're the youngest one, you're gonna be around, maybe be around the longest, so you get to finish. I don't have anything to add to, you know. After, <laughs> after these thoughts, many goals, many goals ahead. Win Euroleague, have Euroleague final four in Kaunas and, and so on and so forth. You know, it's it's not a time to finish about retirement. Look at the Shimon Mizraki, look at, at Maurizio, you know, these guys. Hey guys, slowly, eh? Knock on wood. I mean, that's... 
I, I know that Father Time will catch up to all of us and we don't know how much is left, but uh, yeah, I think Maurizio put it right. It's just hell of a ride. I want to enjoy it. I don't know when, you know, when, when will, that will be enough, but it's every year it's new things. Every year it's something different and, and it's just best job I ever had. There's, there's really not much more to say. Christos, Maurizio, Paulius, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. This was one of the best podcasts I've ever done and most interesting. So thank you guys so much for your time, for your generosity and for your openness. Thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you, guys. You.